everybody. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for having me here today. I'm super excited to talk about um, tools for serious dog breeders. And um, after Mark's talk, I feel really inspired about sharing this information with you. Um, so today we're going to talk about, um, give a little bit of an introduction, and then we're going to talk about DNA test considerations and things that you guys as breeders really need to think about when you're choosing your DNA tests. Um, we'll then go into the AKC DNA program in terms of our original um, panel that's been around for about 25 years, as well as um, health and trait testing in the future. And then I also want to share with you our larger vision of the DNA program and how we're going to move forward. So Patty was super cute about being shocked that I've been in the breed for 30 years, but I was, I'm a second generation Portuguese water dog breeder. I was one of those kids that actually went to the dog show in a stroller, grew up in the whelping box. Um, <laughs> so that was actually an accurate number. Um, and that's kind of partially why I'm here today. And um, I just want to share with you this dog in the middle is kind of the whole reason why I wanted to get into dog genetics. Um, that is my first dog that was ever mine that I was super excited about showing and breeding and everything like that. Um, but actually, she was a replacement for a puppy that unfortunately died of something called juvenile dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so that was a genetic disease that affected Portuguese water dogs while I was growing up. And um, we had a litter that was affected with that, and we lost about half of the puppies. And with that, my family got very much involved with the research behind identifying a genetic, genetic marker for that disease. At that time, we did test breedings with the University of Pennsylvania and also with Tufts to help identify a marker, and now there is a genetic test for that. Um, so that dog in the middle is turn about my heart will go on. Um, also came around, you know, when Titanic was out, but you know, kind of because it was a heart disease and she was kind of the future. So all of my breeding lines go back to her. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and then Patty kind of gave some of my educational background. I did my undergrad at Yale University. I went to um, University of Pennsylvania for vet school, as well as a small animal rotating internship, and then did my clinician investigator program at NC State. So just a little bit about myself. I did juniors. That was my junior dog cookies and cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm here today to talk about tools, and you can't talk about tools with first asking the question, what do breeders really need? So they need tools to help breed better dogs. This is really obvious, but you know, it's, it's really helpful to break it down to the fundamentals. Tools to breed better dogs in terms of health, structure, temperament, and performance. And all of that is really linked to excellent record keeping. Because ideally, you know, as breeders, we want to have a bunch of dogs and be able to, at a very young age, pick the dogs that are going to behave the way we want them to behave um, or have the certain health that we're looking for or have a certain characteristic, characteristic that we're looking for. And that really is the art of breeding. I do want to give a little bit of a history background about the history of heritability and um, where a lot of the foundations for what we understand about genetics came from. So a lot of you might have learned this in school that there is this huge debate between Lamarck and Darwin about how traits are acquired and passed on through generations. So Lamarck was in the camp that acquired traits are inheritable. And so that's kind of the idea that you have giraffes and why do giraffes have long necks? Well, Lamarck thought that the adults were going around and stretching out their necks over time so that they can reach the leaves on the trees in that barren, um, savanna landscape. And as they stretched out their necks, that heritable trait, that trait was passed on to next generations. Darwin, on the other hand, came and said, actually, this, this is passed on through natural selection, and that's through survival of the fittest. So this is the idea that, I mean, it's a little bit of a grim picture, but um, giraffes who happen to have the longer necks were able to eat the trees during the barren times, and those were the ones who survived to pass on their genetics to the next generation. So I think a lot of people are familiar with Darwin and how he went to the Galapagos on his USS Beagle and studied the birds there, but I think people are less familiar with the fact that a lot of Darwin's research was based on breeders. Um, they were the backbone of his science and his observations. Um, he studied a lot of this one guy, Robert Bakewell, 
who was a sheep breeder and he kind of established the Leicester flock and they're really well known for this unique um, coat type. And the thing that made Bakewell pretty remarkable is that he took meticulous records. He wrote things down on slates. Unfortunately, a lot of that has been lost to us because it's slates on chalk. Um, but Darwin observed him and he also started breeding pigeons to help make his observations. So the point I wanna make here is that breeders are the backbone of the science of heredity and how we understand genetics today. And breeders are the one who, ones who are kind of forwarding all of this into the future. So you guys are an integral point, an integral piece of all of this um, science. I do wanna point out also that not all genetic diseases are inherited. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a vocabulary to kind of help everybody get on the same page, but you're also feel free to gloss out. This is too heavy for you. Um, but it's really important to understand the differences of different diseases and definitions. So genetic, like a genetic disease is basically caused by um, whole or in part by a change in a DNA sequence away from the normal sequence. Hereditary, actually like a hereditary disease is caused by a genetic mutation that is transmitted from parents to offspring. You can also have congenital diseases that are present from birth, might not be that genetic, depends. Um, but there's also a de novo mutation that can happen in an individual, and that's a mutation identified in the affected dog and absent in both parents. So I just want to like kind of introduce the idea that not every genetic disease is potentially um, passed on from the parents and things like that. Um, and also just emphasizing that we can use DNA tests to try and predict disease, but we cannot predict everything. Um, going further into this whole idea of using genetic to test to predict disease, the, the body and um, one large organism is really complex. So everyone has their own body and a dog has a body that's made out of multiple different cells. Within that cell, there's a nucleus with um, different chromosomes and that chromosome is made up of different DNA. That DNA, as you zoom into it, has different base pairs and sequencing. And that's what we classically think of for genetic test, tests nowadays, that there's a different base pair change. Um, but then that has to get translated to a protein. So a lot of factors that go into how you interpret a DNA test. Are you looking at one cell, like a white blood cell? Like when we get our salivary tests, um, those are actually white blood cell tests. So if you have a bone marrow or something, a bone marrow transplant, it's not gonna look like your body. Um, whereas like the epithelial cells in your cheek, that's a different type of um, cell with different DNA. So where you get your DNA makes a big factor as well, because not all of your cells are the same. Um, and then again, there can be lots of changes in how that DNA is modified. So just the takeaway from this slide is just that it's really complex and DNA tests are not black and white. And that's kind of one of the big takeaways I wanna get, I wanna tell you guys. DNA tests are tools and they're not the black and white end all be all because there's a lot more that goes into a dog. And with that, I also wanna take this moment to emphasize record keeping. If you do the same thing the same way every time, you start to notice differences. And that record keeping, again, is much more than just what is the result of this one genetic test or not. So I just wanna talk about what tools are available to us. Um, Mark did a wonderful job touching on this. Um, this is Kayak, he's a Leonberger. I'm gonna have a lot of Portuguese water dogs in my talk, obviously, but I decided to throw in some other breeds. Um, so what tools are available? We have DNA tests and I do, I am going to spend a lot of my time on this talk focused on this, but we also have phenotype tests. And I just wanna emphasize that those phenotype tests, maybe they're not looking at a DNA sequence, but they're still potentially genetic in a way, right? So you have your um, tests that we think that um, are recommended by parent clubs that should be screening tests before breeding on a dog. Some of that, I think the, really common ones are like hip radiographs looking for hip dysplasia. We've known for decades that hip dysplasia is inheritable and that's why we screen for it, but there's not a really good genetic test for that. It's multifactorial. So I don't want to, I don't want to kind of lose sight on the fact that these phenotype tests are still in a sense genetic tests. They're just not actually looking at a DNA test. And hopefully as we move on over time, we can develop more genetic tests that match those phenotypic tools. Um, so we can get better and better at predicting things. But that's what we're doing every day when we take a dog to the veterinary hospital for like their eye exams and things like that. And along those lines, breeder observation is really important too. So I think this comes up a lot with color genetics. 
you know, people are like, oh, um, my dog doesn't carry the curly gene, so therefore it's not a curly. Well, use your eyes. Does it look like a curly or not? Maybe curly is a little bit ambiguous, but you know what I mean? Like there are certain traits that you can see are happening just because they don't have one gene doesn't mean that's the whole story. So I just want to emphasize these breeder observations are super important. Um, you need to like second guess kind of things that are on the DNA test because our, our knowledge of DNA tests are evolving over time. Um, so again, I wanted, to, so from there, I want to talk about DNA test considerations and what I really want to advise people to think about when they're interpreting a DNA test. Um, this is going to be really obvious, but I think that sometimes this message gets lost through the weeds. We have over like 250 DNA tests out there right now, but I want to emphasize that disease does not equal disease or um, genetic variant. So you can have disease without presence of a variant, or you can have a variant and um, not get disease. So I'll go into that a little bit more. The type of DNA test also really matters. Um, there's a lot of complicated technology that can go into developing a DNA test. And just some examples of that, is it direct versus linkage? And I'll explain that in a second. Um, is it chromosome based on copy number? Is that test valid? Has it been validated? Are there false positives and false negatives? Um, also, mode of inheritance makes a difference. Like Kind of I introduced before, there are de, de novo mutations that can occur. So just because you produce a puppy, let's say with a cleft palate, is that a novel mutation that's just unique to that dog? Or is there something about the parents that is passing on that heritable trait, so to speak? It's not always something that's a problem with the dam and the sire. It might be something that just spontaneously happened. Um, so that's something to think about when you're thinking about if you developed a disease and you want to remove that breeding stock from your population. Um, We'll also want to talk about the prevalence of a disease, the prevalence of the variant, which might not be the same as the disease, validation in your breeder line, and also concerns. So when we're talking about disease versus variant, I think I want to talk about a disease that's really, really common across the dog world, progressive retinal atrophy, or PRA. This is a degenerative disease of the retina, and the retina is a neurosensory structure in the back of the eye that transmits images to the brain. The clinical signs for this disease is typically progressive loss of vision with variable ages of onset. Um, and it's an inherited disease that's caused by multiple genetic variants. It's typically autosomal recessive, but nomenclature is important. Um, you can have the disease itself is progressive retinal atrophy, and that's like what you can kind of see. But there are also DNA health test names. They still call them progressive retinal atrophy. But then like you need to really look at the specific gene or variant that's involved. So often when you're looking at DNA health tests, they're formatted as disease and then affected gene. Um, so just for PRA, disease is the physical manifestation of a genetic variant. The presence of a disease does not mean a dog has a known genetic variant. And the presence of a variant does not mean a dog will develop disease. So what do I mean by that? There are multiple reasons why a dog might test positive where it might be effective with a disease, but it might not actually manifest that, right? So there can be false positives. So if a test result doesn't make sense, I encourage you to repeat that test, ideally with a new sample and possibly a different lab with a different methodology um, because mistakes can happen. There can even be sample mix-ups within the lab. I mean, these they are com I'm not trying to say that these companies aren't... Um, good at what they do, but human error is always a factor, if you get what I mean. Um, PRA is also a late onset disease. Um, another example of that is degenerative myelopathy. So it's possible that a dog might never develop the disease if they were to pass away before the disease developed. So that's something to think about too. Um, and then there are some multifactorial diseases. As we learn more and more about um, genetics, we start to realize that we might have identified one marker for a disease at one point in time, but we eventually identify more in the future. So again, for PRA, um, diagnosis, we do not diagnose PRA, the disease, based on a genetic test. We diagnosed it based on electroretinograms. That's probably the earliest change you can see. And with people who were around when we were developing the PRA genetic tests, um, this you would go to ER, ERGs and you might see some signs at one and a half years, although it can depend on the um, disease, on the breed. And that's because you're trying to identify the affected dogs before you were going to breed them. That's why genetic tests are so powerful because we can know, right, as a puppy, 
we can help predict if they're going to develop the disease. Um, and then as the disease progresses, you can look at the retina and you can see a decrease in the red blood in the um, blood vessels at the back of the eye and also hyper -ref reflectivity of the tapetum. Any veterinarian can see these changes if they're progressive enough. So if you look at the eye on the right, you can see a really clear retina with all these lines radiating out. Um, I mean, sorry, the optic nerve is the circle and the blood vessel radiating out. And then on the left, you kind of don't really see that as much. That's really obvious. Um, an ophthalmologist, so a board certified, certified ophthalmologist can look at the eye and detect those changes earlier. So again, the genetic tests indicate a possibility of developing disease, but they're not diagnostic for the disease of progressive retinal atrophy. Um, so you need to look at the eye. The other thing that progressive retinal atrophy is a good example for is that there are multiple tests um, and mutations that can lead to the exact same condition. So if you look at the back of the eye, point is from this, there are a lot of cells involved. There's a lot of pathways involved. And that means there are a lot of different ways where the eye can go wrong and develop blindness. So right now there are multiple PRA DNA tests on the market. And it's really important as breeders, this isn't even everything, this is just a small area. It's important as breeders and as we're educating the public that we need to be clear about which one affects our breed um, and which one we really need to look for. But also this, bec like because I was talking about how complex the eye is, we tend to see more and more novel mutations that pop up that cause PRA. So you could have a dog with PRA that tests clear of all of these conditions and you need to start looking. It doesn't mean that dog doesn't have PRA, you know, you have to use your eyes. Um, it means you need to look further for the genetic variant. So this is just a prime example of how complicated it can be. Um, also disease and variant prevalence is something that we really need to keep, up, keep an eye on as breeders. Um, it's almost like a no brainer that you don't wanna breed dogs with variants that can lead to disease, right? But that's a really, really simplistic view. Um, and as I just said, there are diseases that don't even become a problem until a dog is 14. If I have a dog that's living to 14 as a Portuguese water dog breeder, I'm really happy. And I'm not condoning breeding like blind dogs, but if I have a dog who lives to be 14 and happens to be blind, I'm still really happy. Like that dog lived 14 years and didn't die of hemangiosarcoma at eight years old. So it's all about perspective. Um, and so the OFA does a really good job, um, as Mark was also mentioning, of having this registry of posting disease prevalence so that we as breeders can be a community to help um, share this information. They share both the phenotypic tests as well as genetic tests, and they post the prevalence over the generations. I mean, this always has a little bit of bias though, because you know, breeders tend to post their breeding stock as opposed to all of their pet um, population and things like that. So you have to keep these prevalence data with a grain of salt, but these are the type of tools that are out there to help you interpret the genetic tests. So let's say you have a variant that's present. I talk about Sphinx cats. They just, um, Dr. Muir's at North Carolina State University just developed, just diagnosed or just developed a um, genetic test for their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And she said it's incomplete penetrance, whatever. So she's like, try not to breed affected cats. It turns out the prevalence of that variant is in 70% sphinx cats. So how do you breed away from that? You can't necessarily follow typical recommendations. So disease prevalence is super important and the variant prevalence because they're not always the same, right? Um, and so before you make any breeding recommendations on a disease, it's prudent to have the prevalence of that disease and that variant and get that information and then make decisions about how you're going to help decrease the prevalence of that variant in your population. Um, I wanted to take a second to just talk about the type of test that you're looking at. And if you're gonna take away anything from this, I just wanna let you know, read the fine print of each individual DNA tests um, because they are different for each company and for each specific test. Um, and by that, I mean, so I was talking about there are direct tests and linkage tests. So a direct test, like let's say there's an actual mutation, you're looking for the presence or absence of that mutation. A linkage test, everybody can close their eyes if this, if this is complicated and then we can go back. I'll let you know when I'm done. <laughs> um, 
Bottom line, the wonderful thing about dog breeds is that they are really um, homogenous. And so we see that in their genetics. They have these large stretches of their genomes that are exactly the same across that breed. So we can take advantage of that to develop what's called a linkage test. So even if we don't know the exact, what we call causative mutation of a disease, we can find something in that same, what we call haplotype block in that same chunk of DNA that's the same. And we're like, okay, this at, at this site, there's this variant. And that is like maybe 99% of the time linked to the actual true causative variant. And we can use that to develop a test. But there are still situations where you'll have dogs where that one test over, one marker over here is different from the one over here. Like that test isn't actually telling you what's happening on over here. So you always have to keep that in mind basically. And that's why I'm saying, read the fine print. Is it direct or is it a linkage? Um, because I will have less faith in a linkage test than a direct test. Um, I don't wanna, I'm not saying anything about bad, anything bad about any companies, but an example is that um, there's this risk factor for intervertebral disc disease that is a linkage test at Embark, but it's a direct test at like VetGen and UC Davis. And so this knowledge is important for you guys. The linkage test is still very reliable. It's very accurate, but it's not gonna be accurate all the time. Whereas a direct test is going to be more likely, likely to be accurate. So that's just an example of that. To read the fine print. The other thing I wanna mention is also validation. It's really important to understand the context of how these genetic variants were discovered so you can use them to interpret. Um, overall, a lot of our understanding of canine genetics is based on one dog, Tasha, a boxer. She was the first dog that was um, had her entire genome sequenced. Um, dogs have 78, 78 chromosomes and about 25,000 genes. And this is always evolving. We're always improving as we gather more and more data about dogs. We're improving our understanding of the canine ge um, genome. Um, and so when we're looking at one DNA test, you're looking at one variant in the context of a complex genetic landscape that our understanding is predominantly based on a boxer. We all know a boxer is very different from a Pekingese or a Dandy Dinma or a Lapwind or something like that. So that's just something to keep in mind the limit of our science today. And our, um, there are multiple projects that are trying to help bridge those gaps and represent the genomes of some of the rarer breeds, um, but that's just something to keep in mind. This is a complicated si slide, but I just wanna give the example of dermatomyositis and collies versus Shelties. On a very high level basis, um, it was first thought that there were two markers that were linked to dermatomyositis. Um, because if you're looking at collies, they're kind of two markers that are responsible for it. When you look at Shelties, they actually found a third marker. And it turns out the collies have that third marker pretty much fixed in their population, whereas the Shelties have more variability. So you get different recommendations for whether you're a collie or a Sheltie. And this is something that um, Leanne Clark did this work at Clemson University. And this is something that she could have moved forward with launching the test with just the two variants but she could see that something wasn't quite right. And so she kept digging. And so I just also wanna say this more for you guys to understand, just because a variant is out there does not mean it is the whole story, okay? So just to summarize our worries um, with DNA health testing, we're worried about the validity for your breed. Um, also, I haven't touched upon this yet, but a lot of the DNA tests that are offered in the market are for-profit companies. Um, so you have to think about their perspective in terms of the, the advice they're offering. And we really wanna make sure breeders maintain control, control in some of this advice, um, not to scare everybody, but tests, they're tools. DNA tests are tools and they're only as good as the limitations of a tool. They're not the end all be all. And so just some examples in the press about how DNA testing is not 100% accurate. Um, CBS News did an article on um, the accuracy of dog DNA tests. This was more focused on kind of the breed heritage tests that are out there, kind of saying, okay, this looks like it's a great Dane or something like that. But it's still like, it's all based on your reference population and the current understanding of the dog um, genome. And I'm telling you, that's not fully fledged. So we just have to understand that there are limitations. And that goes back to my saying, if something doesn't make sense, retest it. Um, the FDA also warned about patients, patients using prenatal genetic tests to make actionable decisions. So they find 
um, a genetic marker in their blood that's related to um, a genetic condition like Down syndrome or something like that. And people were actually getting abortions because they thought that their babies were non-viable when in fact it was a false positive. So just also something to think about, like it's it's tragic and we just, and we just need awareness about the pros and cons and the limitations of our tools because they are tools. So with that, I want to branch into talking about the AKC DNA program and the vision we have for the future. So um, we are going to start offering basically two core products, the unique identification and parentage verification that we've been doing for um, decades. As, and then we're also going to be launching DNA health and traits testing. So AKC has a pretty robust database of samples. We have nearly a million genotypes in our database. Um, it's the world's largest canine DNA database, which is a fact that we're very proud of. The top five breeds represented are Labrador Retrievers, Yorkies, German Shepherds, Dachshunds, and Poodles, kind of the most common breeds across the nation. Our unique identification and parentage verification panel, um, we designed this over 20 years ago as an internal database to assess parentage on every sample submitted. So we basically, it's a marker test to get a genetic identity on every dog that then goes into our database that's checked against the sire and dam to verify the accuracy of our registry and really protect it. Um, it also aids in record keeping and helps with multi-sire litters to give breeders more tools to help produce accurate pedigrees. When we first launched, there were error rates of about 10%. We've got it, gotten it down to less than 2%. And I think as we all know as breeders, the error is not even necessarily intentional fraud or something like that. Like dogs have breedings through fences and people don't even know there's a problem until they run the DNA and they're like, oops, something happened. You know, dogs are dogs, life is life. So this has been a huge, <laughs> this has been a huge asset to the AKC. Um, so the other thing we're really focused on launching this summer is health and traits testing. We're hoping it to be, we're hoping to have it to be very focused that's following the parent club recommendations. Um, it's gonna be educational with the genetic counseling center to provide kind of more um, targeted advice that's specific to breeders. And it's gonna be reliable. Um, every health and trait test that we're gonna have is also going to include our initial um, genetic identity. So you get that internal validation that the dog you're, you're testing your health test for is actually the dog that you're getting results for, which I think is really positive. And that's going to be unique to the AKC. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about parent club recommendations? Um, the AKC has um, basically the parent clubs contribute these parent club health statements to the AKC. We use these now to help guide breeder of merit recommendations, bred with heart recommendations. And a lot of these also correlate with the um, chick um, recommendations at OFA. So we have the parent clubs themselves, so breeders, the experts in the field telling us what they think are the most important tests to look for in their breeds. And we're gonna help filter our DNA results to, to um, reflect what breeds think are important. We're still going to provide all of the health testing like a multiplex panel. And that's because it's really hard to get away from that. Um, people might have individual concerns in their line um, or there might be you know, something else that's popping up that we do wanna make sure we give that information for. But also it's really overwhelming to get a panel of like 250 health tests and maybe it's positive for one that you're not actually that concerned about because it doesn't affect your breed. So we wanna provide both aspects to provide clarity. Um, as you can see, there's a lot, of, um, a lot that goes into um, interpreting these results. So we, we started a counseling center, already have hired two registered veterinary technicians. Um, we're gonna be providing non-judgmental advice so that we're a source of reliable information. And this is kind of to provide a framework of reliable thought processes for you guys to think about, kind of like where we're talking about, thinking about, okay, was this genetic test validated in your breed? What is the prevalence in your breed? Um, and then also kind of, you can do proposed matings and things like that, um, but we will not tell anybody what to do. We just no notice that there's a gap in the um, DNA world about really practical, recommendations for interpreting these DNA health tests. And we're here to help provide the framework for you guys to make sure that you're asking the right questions and have confidence in using the results in a way that makes sense for you. So moving on into the future, 
AKC, I mean, we kind of hinted at this, but we feel like there's a very large um, educational responsibility that we have to help as we develop more and more health tests to help um, breeders interpret what they mean. Um, we're also going to be looking at expanding our data. So we're gonna have sequencing on every dog, which I'll explain a little bit. We're looking into academic collaborations on canine health and also academic collaborations on comparative human and canine research. So we're really excited about some of these, um, these things we're doing and we're really committed to taking the DNA program into a way that really services breeders to help breeders breed better dogs for the whole community in general. So for education, we do already have some free classes on AKC's Canine College around genetics, and we're hoping to expand that. Um, as Mark said, we also have had breeder symposiums. Um, I did give a talk at the International Kennel Club in Chicago. I'll be at Houston providing some of those. Um, and we're really hoping to keep this moving forward. And then from a veterinary perspective, we will really want to become a leader in the field of genetic counseling. So we're looking into providing continuing education for veterinary technicians as well so that more and more veterinarians can become, and their veterinary technicians can become educated in how to help breeders make these decisions. I hinted at sequencing every dog. Um, right now, a lot of these tests on the market look at panels of like what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms. So you're getting maybe like 200,000 or 700,000 markers on a dog, which is really powerful information. But as technology advances, um, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to get more and more markers. And so there's something called low pass whole genome sequencing, where in a very short period of time, we'll be able to get a whole genome of information, information on a dog in every single dog submitted to the AKC DNA program. And we're hoping to have that by 2025. Um, this is really complicated statistics that are around this, but when you're doing the whole genome on a dog to make it affordable, there are some areas in the genome where you might get like 200 copies of that region and get really comp a lot of confidence in that read, but there are other areas where you might get one copy or zero copies and you have to fill in the gaps. And so you use complicated statistics based on a reference panel to fill in those gaps. Um, I, I mentioned before that a lot of our reference panel information is based on Tasha. Um, there is a 10K genome project going on where the NIH and um, other groups are sequencing 10,000 dogs to make sure that we really re build robust reference panel information. But the AKC DNA program um, recognizes the need that with those public access dogs, we might not re -reflecting, be reflecting all of the breeds that are recognized by the AKC. Um, and we also have a unique position at the AKC where we can use our pedigrees to make sure that we, if we're picking dogs to represent um, this reference panel, and, and we're really going to be using this reference panel to drive canine research and health and every all our, all our understanding of all of this into the future. We really want to make sure that reference panel reflects the dogs that are at the AKC um, so it can be a really valuable tool and we fill in some of the gaps of these questions like how does this variant look in a um, I don't know, like in an um, Icelandic sheepdog or something like that. There aren't very many Icelandic sheepdogs. We want to make sure they're represented. So we um, already invested research um, and funds into sequencing about 2,000 to 4,000 dogs to represent all AKC recognized breed, breeds and FSS and miscellaneous. Um, we're looking at pedigrees to make sure we're representing the full genetic diversity, going back to the founders. And that's going to help provide context to genetic variants and provide better products in the future. So we're really excited about that. We're very committed to taking our proceeds from health and pouring it back into dogs. And with that, you can see some really powerful potential in what we can do as a breeding community to help advance canine research. Um, we'll have all of that wonderful DNA information available. Um, AKC already does a wonderful job of tracking pedigrees and registries and things like that. But, um, and we do have a lot of information on phenotype, like which dogs are champions, which dogs are titled in agility and things like that. But we're also looking to expand that more to include um, more health taste testing databases and things like that. Because a dog is more than just did it win, um, did it win at Westminster or did it, is it a champion? It's how does that dog interact with children? How does that dog perform the um, tasks that it was bred to do and have its innate ability? And we're looking to expand our ability to track those phenotypes so we can correlate it with the DNA and the pedigree. And health is an important part of that phenotype as well. 
As we build this, we can look to give academic data grants, and that will help expedite canine health research. Um, we're structuring that based on having an academic review board similar to the AKC CHF. So the CHF gives out financial grants to academic institutions, whereas the AKC DNA program is sitting on a wealth of genomic information that we can share to researchers. So traditionally, if um, I, mean, I think a lot of people in this room probably have experienced this, you identify a health concern, then you have to go out to your, um, your breed club and find dogs that are affected with it. Then you have to collect samples. You have to give it to a researcher. The researcher then has to get it. Oh, sorry. The researcher then has to get enough samples together where they can isolate the DNA and then run the bioinformatics on that, or, or sorry, run the sequencing. Sequencing, you really want to batch things together. Um, and then you have to run the bioinformatics. So if we have all this data available, you guys can say, hey, we have this, this health concern we're worried about. These are the dogs that are affected. We can set up a proposal where we take the data from those dogs, give it straight to the researcher, and that cuts out years of work. So we're really excited about that. Um, so I'm going to kind of wrap up a little bit. It's really important as you guys as breeders to be citizen scientists. Be your own scientist for your breeding program. Like you guys, like all of our understanding of genetics comes back to breeders. Um, that means meticulous records, consistency from litter to litter, um, keeping track of your pedigrees, keeping track of your DNA parentage test, the genetic identity to verify your parentage, um, to make notes of your observations. Those are really important to you. Whelping issues, congenital abnormalities. Because um, I, as I mentioned kind of briefly, just because a dog is born with a problem doesn't mean it, it inherited it from its parents. So you want to keep track of that so you can notice trends. Um, get follow-up from owners. That can be really hard. I know as a breeder, I tend to hear if there are major problems, but I don't always hear all of the less important problems. Um, and that can be maybe having really meticulous medical records and health testing. So we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Um, just switching gears slightly, I want to go back to the initial discussion we had about the history of heritability. We tend to think that Darwin won, right, that natural selection is how genetics are passed. But as we learn more and more, we start to realize that there are other ways the genome can be impacted during the lifespan of a dog. So there can be epigenetics, different modifications to the genome that are then passed on through generations. So there's an interesting book, Lamarck's Revenge, that <laughs> talks about some of these um, evolving understanding of DNA. And again, just, just kind of emphasizing that if something doesn't make sense, sense, question it, because our understanding of this is not black and white and it's evolving every day. And with that also, um, pets and people share the environment too. Um, we think a lot of the genetic diseases are actually impacted by environment and that plays a big role and it can affect epigenetics. And so we as the AKC want to kind of start looking into that avenue as well for advancing research. Um, there have been studies that show that people are exposed to the same things that the, as their pets. Um, that can be indoor air and dust particles and things like that. And Mark Dunn did speak at the National Academy of Sciences workshop on this. Um, and so it's kind of as I, I think we did a lot of the low hanging fruit for genetics and for our genetic tests but things are getting more and more complex and we need to start to make sure that we're continuing to provide the tools that breeders need to provide better dogs. Um, so we're looking into those types of collaborations as well. And with that, um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm really excited. Um, we're really here to work as a team. So we're empowering breeders to improve the health of breeds. We're giving you guys frameworks and confidence to make sure that you're interpreting things the way they should be. And we're trying to provide you with reliable tools to do so. And all of that is getting poured back into service to help you guys with education and advancing research. <laughs>